The next thing now to be related is that Bjorn Harolfsson went out from Greenland and visited Eric Jarl, and the Jarl received him well. Bjorn told about his voyages, that he had seen unknown lands, and that people thought he had shown no curiosity when he had nothing to relate about these countries, and this became somewhat a matter of reproach to him. Bjorn became one of the Jarl's courtiers, and came back to Greenland the summer after. There was now much talk about voyages of discovery. Leif, the son of Eric the Red, of Bratterhild, went to Bjorn Herolfsson and bought at the ship of him, and engaged men for it, so that there were thirty-five men in all. Leif asked his father Eric to be the leader of the voyage, but Eric excused himself, saying that now he was pretty well stricken in years, he could not now, as formerly, hold out all the hardships of sea. Leif said that he was still the one of the family whom good fortune would soonest attend, and Eric gave way to Leif's request, and rode from home so soon as they were ready, and it was but a short way to the ship. The horse stumbled that Eric rode, and he fell off, and bruised his foot. Then said Eric, It was not ordained that I should discover more countries than that which we now inhabit, and we should make no further attempt in company. Eric went home to Bratterhild, but Leif repaired to the ship, and his comrades with him, thirty-five men. There was a southern on the voyage, named Tyrker. Now that they prepared their ship, and sailed out to the sea, when they were ready, and they found that the land which first Bjorn had found last, there sailed they to this land, and cast anchor, and put off boats, and went ashore, and saw there was no grass. Great icebergs were all up over the country, but like a plain of flat stones was all from the sea to the mountains, and it appeared to them that this land had no good qualities. Then said Leif, We have not done like Bjorn about this land, that we have not been upon it. Now I will give this land a name, and call it Heluland. Then they went on board, and after that sailed out to sea, and found another land. They sailed again to the land, and cast anchor, and put off boats, and went on shore. This land was flat, and covered with wood, and white sands were far around where they went, and the shore was low. Then said Leif, This land shall be named after its qualities, and be called Markland, Woodland. They then immediately returned to the ship. Now they sailed thence into the open sea, with a northeast wind, and were two days at sea before they saw land. And they sailed thither, and came to an island, which lay to the eastward of the land, and went up there, and looked around them in good weather, and observed that there was dew upon the grass. And so it happened that they touched the dew with their hands, and raised the fingers to the mouth, and they thought that they had never before tasted anything so sweet. After that, they went to the ship and sailed into a sound, which lay between the island and a ness, which ran out towards the eastward of the land, and then steered westwards past the ness. It was very shallow at ebb tide, and their ship stood up, so that it was far to see from the ship to the water. But so much did they desire to land, that they did not give themselves time to wait, until the water again rose under their ship, but ran at once on shore, at a place where the river flows out of a lake. But so, soon as the waters rose up under the ship, they took their boats, and they rowed out to the ship, and they floated it up to the river, and thence into the lake, where they cast anchor, and brought up from the ship their skin cots, and made their booths. After this, they took counsel, and formed the resolution of remaining there for the winter, and built their large houses. There was no want of salmon, either in the river or the lake, and larger salmon than they had before seen. The nature of the country was, as they thought, so good that cattle would not require house-feeding in winter, for there came no frost in winter, and little did the grass wither here. But when they had done with the house-building, Leif said to his comrades, Now I will divide our men into two parts, and have the land explored, and the half of men shall remain at home and at the house, while the other half explore the land. But, however, not go further than they can come home in the evening, and they should not separate. Now they did so for a time, and Leif changed about, so that one day he went with them, and the other he remained at home in the house. Leif was a great and strong man, grave and well-favoured, therewith sensible and moderate in all things. It happened one evening that a man of the party went missing, and this was Tyrker the German. 
This took Leif much to heart, for Tyrker had long been his father and him, and loved Leif much in his childhood. Leif now took his people severely to task, and prepared to seek for Tyrker, and took twelve men with him. But when they had gotten a short way from the house, then came Tyrker towards them, and he was joyfully received. Leif soon saw that his foster father was not right in his senses. Tyrka had a high forehead and unsteady eyes, and was freckled in the face, small and mean in stature, but excellent in all kinds of artifice. Then Leif said to him, Why wert thou so late, my fosterer, and separated from the party? He now spoke first for a long time, in German, and rolled his eyes about to different sides, and twisted his mouth, but they did not understand what he said. After a time he spoke Norse. I have not been much further off, but still I have something new to tell of. I found vines and grapes. But that is true, my fosterer, quoth Leif. Surely it is true, replied him, for I was bred up in a land where there is no want of either vines or grapes. They slept now for the night, but in the morning Leif said to his sailors, We will now set about two things, in that the one day we will gather grapes, and the other day cut vines and fell trees, so from hence we will be loading for my ship. And this was the counsel taken, and it is said that their long boat was filled with grapes. Now was a cargo cut down for the ship, and when the spring came they got ready and sailed away, and Leif gave the land a name after its qualities, and he called it Vinland, or Wineland. They sailed now into the open sea, and had a fair wind until they saw Greenland, and the mountains below the Jocklers. Then a man put in his word and said to Leif, Why do you steer so close to the wind? Leif answered, I attend to my steering and something more, and can you not see anything? They answered that they could not observe anything extraordinary. I know not, said Leif, whether I see a ship or a rock. Now looked they, and said it was a rock, but he saw so much sharper than they, that he perceived that there were men on the rock. Now let us, said Leif, hold our winds so that we may come up to them, and if they should want our assistance, and the necessity demands that we should help them. And if they should not be kindly disposed, the power is in our hands, and not theirs. Now sailed they under the rock, and lowered their sails and cast anchor, and put out another little boat, which they had with them. Then asked Tyrka who their leader was. He called himself Thora, and he said that he was a Northman. But what is thy name? he said. Leif told his name. Art thou a son of Eric the Red, of Bratterhild? Quoth he. Leif answered that it was so. Now will I, said Leif, take ye on board my ship, and as much of the goods as the ship can hold. They accepted this offer, and sailed thereupon to Eriksfjord, with the cargo, and thence to Bratterhild, where they unloaded the ship. After that, Leif invited Thora and his wife Gudrid, and three other men to stop with him, and got berths for the other seamen, as well as Thora's and his own, elsewhere. Leif took fifteen men from the rock. He was, after that, called Leif the Lucky. Leif had now earned both riches and respect. The same winter came a heavy sickness among Thora's people, and carried off, as well as Thora himself, as many of his men. This winter died also Eric the Red, now there was much talk about Leif's voyage to Vinland, and Thorvald, his brother, thought that the land had been much too little explored. Then said Leif to Thorvald, Thou canst go with my ship, brother, if thou wilt, to Vinland, but I wish first that the ship should go and fetch the timber which Thora had upon the rock, and so was done. Thorvald repairs to Vinland. Now Thorvald made ready for his voyage with thirty men, and took counsel thereon with Leif, his brother. They made their ship ready and put to sea, and nothing is told of their voyage until they came to Leif's booths in Vinland. There they laid up their ship and spent a pleasant winter, and caught fish for their support. But in the spring, said Thorvald, that they should make ready the ship, and that some of the men should take the ship's longboat around the western part of the land and explore there during the summer. To them this appeared the fair and woody, but a short distance between the wood and the sea, and the white sands, there were many islands, and much shallow water. They found neither dwellings of men nor beasts, except upon an island, to the westward, where they found a corn shed of wood, but many works of men they found not. And then they went back, 
and came to Leith's booths in the autumn. But the next summer went Thorvald to eastward with the ship and round the land to the northward. Here came a heavy storm upon them, when off a ness, that, so that were driven to the shore, and the keel broke off from the ship, and they remained here a long time, and repaired their ship. Then said Thorvald to his companions, Now will I that we fix up the keel here upon the ness. We will call it Keelness. And so did they. After that they sailed away around the eastern shores of the land, and into the mouths of the firths, which lay nearest thereto, and to a point of land that stretched out, and was all covered with wood. There they came to with the ship, and shoved out a plank to the land, and Thorvald went up to the country with all his companions. He then said, Here it is beautiful, and I would like to raise my dwelling. Then they went to the ship, and saw upon the sands within the promontory three elevations, and went thither, and saw there three skin boats, and three men under each. Then divided they their people, and caught them all, except one who got away with his boat. They killed the other eight, and went back to the cape, and looked around them, and saw some heights inside of the firth, and supposed that these could be dwellings. After that, so great a drowsiness came upon them, that they could not keep awake, and they fell all asleep. Then a shout came over them, so that they all awoke. Thus said the shout, Wake thou, Thorvald, and all thy companions, if thou wilt preserve the life, return thou to thy ship with all thy men, and leave the land without delay. Then rushed out from the interior of the firth an innumerable crowd of skin boats, and made towards them. Thorvald said then, We will put out the battle screen, and defend ourselves as well as we can, but fight little against them. So did they, and the scrailing shot at them for a time, but afterwards ran away, each as fast as they could. Then asked Thorvald his men if they had gotten any wounds, and they answered that no one was wounded. I have gotten a wound under the arm, said he, for an arrow fled between the edge of the ship and the shield, in under my arm, and here is the arrow, and it will prove a mortal wound to me. Now counsel I ye that ye get ready and instantly to depart, but ye shall bear me to that cape where I thought it was best to dwell. It may be that a true word fell from my mouth, that I should dwell there for a time. There ye shall bury me, and set up crosses at my head and feet, at the place we call Croasinus, forever in all time to come. Greenland was then Christianized, but Eric the Red died before Christianity was introduced. Now Thorvald died, but they did all things according to his directions, and then went away, and returned with their companions, and told to each other the tidings of what they knew, and dwelt there for the winter, and gathered grapes and vines to load the ship. But in the spring they made ready to sail to Greenland, and came with their ship to Eriksfjord, and could now tell great tidings to Leif. The Unsuccessful Voyage of Thorstein Eriksson Meantime it happened in Greenland that Thorstein in Eriksfjord married Gudrid, Thorbjorn's daughter, who had been formerly married to Thora the Eastman, as it was before related. Now Thorstein Eriksson conceived a desire to go to Vinland after the body of Thorvald his brother, and he made ready the same ship, and chose great and strong men for the crew, and had with him twenty-five men, and Gudrid his wife. They sailed away so soon as they were ready, and came out of sight of land. They drove about in the sea the whole summer, and knew not where they were, and when the first week of winter was past, they landed they in Leesfjord in Greenland, in the western settlement. Thorstein sought shelter for them, and procured lodging for all of his crew, but he himself and his wife were without lodging, and they therefore remained some two nights in the ship. Then was Christianity yet new in Greenland. Now it came to pass one day that some people repaired early in the morning to their tent, and the leader of the party asked who was in the tent. Thorstein answered, There are two persons, but who asked the question? Thorstein is my name, said the other, and I am called Thorstein the Black. But my business here is to bid ye both, thou and thy wife, to come and stop at my house. Thorstein said that he would like to talk the matter over with his wife, but she told him to decide, and he accepted the bidding. Then I will come after ye in the morning with horses, for I want nothing to entertain ye both, but it is very wearisome at my house, for we are there but two, I and my wife, and I am very morose. I also have a different religion from yours, and yet I hold that for the better which ye have. 
Now came him after them in the morning with the horses, and they went to the lodge with Thorstein the Black, who showed them every hospitality. Gudrid was a grave and dignified woman, and therewith sensible, and knew well how to carry herself among strangers. Early that winter came sickness amongst Thorstein Eriksson's men, and many of his people died. Thorstein had coffins made for the bodies of those who died, and caused them to be taken out to the ship, and there laid. For I will, he said, have all the bodies taken to Eriksfjord in the summer. Now it was not long before the sickness also came into Thorstein's house, and his wife, who hight Grimhild, took the sickness first. She was very large and strong as a man, but still did the sickness master her. And soon after that the disease attacked Thorstein Eriksson, and they both lay ill at the same time. And Grimhild, the wife of Thorstein the Black, died. But when she was dead, then went Thorstein out of the room, after a plank to lay the body on, and said to Gudrid, Stay not long away, my Thorstein, he answered, so that it should be. Then said Thorstein Eriksson, Strangely now, our house mother is going on, for she pushes herself up on the elbows, and stretches her feet out of bed, and feels for her shoes. At that moment came in the husband, Thorstein, and Grimhild then lay down, and every beam in the room creaked. Now Thorstein made a coffin for Grimhild's body, and took it out and buried it. But although he was a large and powerful man, it took all of his strength to bring it out of the place. Now the sickness attacked Thorstein Eriksson, and he died, which his wife Gudrid took much to heart. They were then all in the room. Gudrid had taken her seat upon the chair beyond the bench, upon which Thorstein her husband had lain. Then Thorstein the host took Gudrid from the chair upon his knees, sat down with her upon another bench, just opposite Thorstein's body. He comforted her in many ways, and cheered her up, and promised to go with her to Eriksfjord, with her husband's body, and those of his companions. And I will also, he added, bring many servants to comfort and amuse thee. She thanked him. Then Thorstein Eriksson sat himself up on his bench, and said, Where is Gudrid? Three times he said that, but she answered not. Then said she to Thorstein the host, Shall I answer his questions or not? He counselled her not to answer. After this, went Thorstein the host across the floor, and sat himself on a chair. But Gudrid sat upon his knees, and said, What wilt thou, namesake? After a little, he answered, I wish much to tell Gudrid her fortune, in order that she may be better reconciled to my death, for I have now come to a good resting place. But this I can tell thee, Gudrid that thou wilt be married to an Icelander, and ye shall live long together, and have a numerous posterity, powerful, distinguished, and excellent, sweet and well favoured. Ye shall remove from Greenland to Norway, and from thence to Iceland. There shall ye live long, and thou shalt outlive him. Then wilt thou go abroad, and travel to Rome, and come back again to Iceland, to thy house, and then will a church be built, and thou wilt reside there, and become a nun, and there thou wilt die. When he had said these words, Thorstein fell back, and his corpse was set in order, and taken to the ship. Now Thorstein the host kept well all the promises he had made to Gudrid. In the spring he sold his farm, and his cattle, and he betook himself to the ship with Gudrid, and all that he possessed. He made ready the ship, and procured men therefore, and then sailed to Eriksfjord. The bodies were now buried by the church. Gudrid repaired to Leith in Bratterhild, but Thorstein the Black made himself a dwelling at Eriksfjord, and dwelt there so long as he lived, and was looked upon as a very able man. Vinland the Good is discovered. The same winter was Leif, the son of Eric the Red, with King Olaf in good repute, and embraced Christianity. But the summer that Gissur went to Iceland, King Olaf sent Leif to Greenland, in order to make known Christianity there. He sailed the same summer to Greenland. He found in the sea some people on a wreck and helped them, and at the same time discovered he Vinland the Good, and came in to harvest to Greenland. He had with him a priest and other clerks, and went to dwell at Bratterhild with Eric his father. Men called him afterwards Leif the Lucky, but Eric his father said that these two things went against one another inasmuch as Leif had saved the crew of the ship, but brought evil men to Greenland, namely the priests. 
The Saga of Thorfinn Kalesfini. Thord Heitz, a man who lived in Hofta, in Hofta Strand, he married Frigerda, daughter of Thora Heimer, and Frigerda, daughter of Kjarval, king of the Irish. Thord was the son of Bjarni Birunsmjor, son of Thorvald Rig, son of Aesilic, son of Bjarni Jansid, son of Ragnar Lodbrok. They had a son called Snorri. He married Thorhild Ryupa, daughter of Thord Gela. Their son was Thord Hestofti. Thorfinn Kalsefni hight Thord's son. Thorfinn's mother hight Thorum. Thorfinn took to trading voyages and was thought an able seaman and merchant. One summer, Kalsefni fitted out his ship and purposed a voyage to Greenland. Snorri Thorbranson of Alpechfjord went with him, and there were some forty men in the ship. Karlsefni and the others put to sea with these two ships, so soon as they were ready. Nothing is told about how long they were at sea, but it is to be related that both of these ships came to Eriksfjord in the autumn. Eric rode to the ship together, with several of the inhabitants, and they began to deal in a friendly manner. Both of the ship's captains beg Eric, Leif, to take as much of the goods as he wished, but Eric, Leif, was on his side, showed them hospitality and bade the crews of these two ships home for the winter to his own house at Bratterhild. This the merchants accepted and thanked him. Then were their goods removed to Bratterhild. There was no want of large outhouses to keep the goods in, neither plenty of everything that was required, wherefore they were well supplied in the winter. But towards Yule, Leif began to be silent and was less cheerful than he used to be. One time turned Karlsefni towards Leif and said, Hast thou any sorrow, Leif, my friend? People think to see that thou art less cheerful than thou wert wont to be. Thou hast entertained us with the greatest splendour, and we are bound to return it to thee, with such services as we can command. Say now, what troubles thee? Ye are friendly and thankful, and I have no fear as concerns of our intercourse that ye will feel the want of attention. But, on the other hand, I fear that when ye come elsewhere, it will be said that ye have never passed a worse Yule than which now approaches, when Eric the Red entertained you at Bratterhild in Greenland. It shall not be so, yeoman, said Karlsefni. We have in our ship both malt and corn. Take as much as thou desirest thereof, and make ready a feast as grand as thou wilt. This leaf accepted, and now preparation was made for the feast of Yule, and this feast was so grand that people thought they had hardly ever seen the like, pomp in a poor land. And after Yule, Karlsefni disclosed to Eric that he wished to marry Gudrid, for it seemed to him as if he had the power in this matter. Eric answered favourably, and said that she must follow her fate, and that he had heard nothing but good of him, and it ended so that Thorfinn married Gudrid, and then the feast was extended, and their marriage was celebrated, and this happened at Bratterhild in the winter. The Expedition to and the Settlement in Vinland by Thorfinn Karlsefni In Bratterhild began people to talk very much about that Vinland the Good should be explored, and it was said that a voyage thither would be particularly profitable by reason of the fertility of the land. And it went so far that Karlsefni and Snorri made ready their ship to explore the land in the spring. With them went before them named men height Bjarni and Thorhall with their ship. There was a man height Thorvald, and he married Freydis, a natural daughter of Eric the Red. He went also with them, and Thorvald the son of Eric, and Thorhall who was called the Hunter. He had long been with Eric, and served him as huntsman in the summer, and a steward in the winter. He was a large man and strong, black and like a giant silent and foul-mouthed in his speech, and always egged on Eric to the worst. He was a bad Christian, and he was well acquainted with uninhabited parts. He was in the ship with Thorvard and Thorvald. They had the ship which Thorbjorn had brought out. They had in all 160 men. When they sailed to the western settlement, and from thence to Biani, they sailed then two days to the south, then they saw land, and put off boats, and explored the land, and found their great flat stones, many of which were twelve ells broad. 
foxes were there. They gave the land a name, and called it Heluland. Then sailed they two days, and turned from the south to the southeast, and found a land covered with wood, and many wild beasts upon it. An island lay there, an island lay there, out from the land to the southeast. There they killed a bear, and called the place afterwards Bear Island, but the land Markland. Thence sailed they far to the southward, along the land, and came to a ness, and land lay upon the right. There were long and sandy strands. They rode to land, and found there upon the ness the keel of a ship, and called the place Kjallanes, and the strands they called Fjordestrands, strands, for it was long to sail by them. Then became the land indented with coves, and they ran the ship into a cove. King Olaf Tryggvason had given Leif two Scotch people, a man hight Haki, and a woman hight Hekia, and they were swifter than beasts. These people were in the ship with Karlsefni, but when they had sailed past the further strands, then set they the Scots on the shore, and bade them run out to the southward of the land, to explore its qualities, and come back again within three days. They had a sort of clothing which they called Kjafal, which was so made that a hat was on the top, and it was open at the sides, and no arms to it, fastened together between the legs with buttons and clasps, but in other places it was open. They stayed away the appointed time, but when they came back, one hand in the hand a bunch of grapes, and the other a new sown ear of wheat. These went on board the ship, and after that they sailed farther. They sailed into a firth, there lay an island before it, round which there are strong currents. Therefore they called it Stream Island. There were so many aider ducks on the island that one could scarcely walk in consequence of the eggs. They called the place Stream Firth. They took their cargo from the ship and prepared to remain there. They had with them all sorts of cattle. The country there was very beautiful. They undertook nothing but to explore the land. They were there for the winter without having provided food beforehand. In the summer, the fishing declined, and they were badly off for provisions. Then disappeared Thorhall the huntsman. They had previously made prayers to God for food, but it did not come so quick as they thought their necessities required. They searched after Thorhall for three days, and found him on top of a rock. There he lay and looked up in the sky, and gaped with both nose and mouth, and murmured something. They asked him why he had gone there. He said it was no business of theirs. They bade him come home with them and he did so. Soon after, there came a whale, and they went thither and cut it up, and no one knew what sort of whale it was, and when they cooked and dressed it, then they ate, they all became ill in consequence. Then said Thorhall, The red-bearded was more helpful than your Christ. This have I got now for my verses, that I son of Thor, my protector, seldom has he deserted me. But when they came to know this, they cast the whole whale into the sea, and resigned their case to God. Then the weather improved, and it was possible to row out fishing, and they were not then in want of provisions, for wild beasts were caught on the land, and fish in the sea, and eggs collected on the island. Of Karlsefni and Thorhall So is said that Thorhall would go to the northward along the further strands, to explore Vinland, but Karlsefni would go southwards along the coast. Thorhall got ready, out under the island, and there were no more together than nine men, but all of the others went with Karlsefni. Now when Thorhall bore water to his ship, and drank, he sung this song. People told me when I came, hither all would be so fine, the good Vinland known to fame, rich in fruits, and the choicest wine. Now the water pale they send, to the fountain I must bend, nor from out of this land divine, have I quaffed one drop of wine? And when they were ready, and hoisted sail, then chanted Thorhall, Let our trusty band haste to the fatherland, Let our vessel brave plough through the angry wave, Vinland here may rove, Or with idle toil fetid whales may boil, Here on further strands, far from fatherland. After that they sailed northwards, past Ferdestrands and Kjallanus, and would cruise to the westward. Then came them a strong west wind, and they were driven away to Ireland, and there were beaten and made slaves according to what the merchants have said.
and now is to be told about Carlsefni, that he went to the southward along the coast, and Snorri and Bjarn with their people. They sailed a long time until they came to a river, which ran out from the land and through a lake out into the sea. It was very shallow, and one could not enter the river without high water. Carlsefni sailed with his people into the mouth, and they called the place Hop. They found there upon the land self-sown fields of wheat, where there were ground. <clears throat> they found there upon the land self-sown fields of wheat, there where the ground was low, but vines there where it rose somewhat. Every stream was full of fish. They made holes there where the land commenced, and the waters rose highest. And when the tide fell, there were secured fish in the holes. There were a great number of all kinds of wild beasts in the woods. They remained there half a month, and amused themselves, and did not perceive anything new. They had their cattle with them. And one morning early, when they looked around, they saw a great many canoes, and poles were swung upon them, and it sounded like the wind in a straw stack, and the swinging was with the sun. Then said Carlsefni, What may this denote? Snorri Thorbranson answered him, it may be that this is a sign of peace, so let us take a white shield and hold it towards them. And so they did. Upon this others rode towards them, and looked with wonder upon those that they met, and went up on the land. These people were black and ill-favoured, and had coarse hair on their head. They had large eyes and broad cheeks. They remained there for some time, and gazed upon those that they met, and rode afterwards away to the southward, around the Ness. Carlsefni and his people had made their dwellings above the lake, and some of the houses were near the water, others more distant. Now were they there for the winter, there came no snow, and all of their cattle fed themselves on the grass. But when spring approached, they saw one morning early that a number of canoes rode from the south around the Ness, so many as if the sea was sown with coal. Poles were also swung on each boat. Carlsefni and his people then raised up the shield, and when they came together, they began to barter. And these people would rather have red cloth than anything else. For this they had to offer skins and real furs. They would also purchase swords and spears, but this Carlsefni and Snorri forbade. For an entire fur skin, the Skraelings took a red piece of cloth, a span long, and bound it to their heads. Thus went on their traffic for a time. Then the cloth began to fall short among Carlsefni and his people, and they cut it asunder into small pieces that were not wider than the breadth of a finger, and still the Skraelings gave just as much for that as for before, and more. It happened that a bull, which Carlsefni had, ran out from the wood and roared aloud. This frightened the Skraelings, and they rushed to their canoes, rowed away to the southward, around the coast. After that, they were not seen for three entire weeks. But by the end of that time, a great number of Skraelings boats were seen coming from the south like a rushing torrent. All the poles were turned from the sun, and they all howled very loud. Then took Carlsefni's people a red shield, and held it towards them. The Skraelings jumped out of their ships, and after this went they against each other and fought. There was a sharp shower of weapons, for the Skraelings had slings. Carlsefni's people saw that they raised up on a pole an enormous large ball, something like a sheep's paunch and of a blue colour. This they swung from the pole over Carlsefni's men, upon the ground, and it made a frightful crash as it fell down. This caused great alarm to Carlsefni and all his people, so that they thought of nothing but running away, and they fell back along the river, for it appeared to them that the Skraelings pressed upon them from all sides, and they did not stop until they came to some rocks, where they made stout resistance. Freydis came out, and saw that Carlsefni's people fell back, and she cried out, Why do ye run, stout men as you are, before these miserable wretches, whom I thought you would knock down like cattle? And if I had weapons, methinks I could fight better than any of ye. They gave no heed to her words. Freydis would go without them, but she was slower because she was pregnant. However, she followed them into the wood. The Skraelings pursued her, she found a dead man before her, it was Thorbrand Snorrison, and there stood a flat stone stuck in his head. The sword lay naked by his side. She took this up, 
and prepared to defend herself. Then came the scralings towards her. She drew out her breasts from under her clothes and dashed them against the naked sword. By this, the scralings became frightened and they ran off to their ships and rode away. Carlsefni and his people then came up and praised her courage. Two men fell on Carlsefni's side, but a number of the scralings. Carlsefni's band was overmatched, and now they drew home to their dwellings and bound their wounds, and they thought over what crowd that could have been, which pressed upon them from the land side, and it now appeared to them that they could scarcely have been real people from the ships, but that they must have been optical illusions. The scralings also found a dead man, and an axe lay by him. One of them took up the axe and cut wood with it, and now, after another time, did the same, and thought it was an excellent thing, and it bit well. But after one took it and cut it a stone, so that the axe broke, and then thought they that it was no use, because it would not cut stone, and they threw it away. Carlsefni and his people now thought that they saw, though the land had many good qualities, Still would they always be exposed there to fear of hostilities from the earlier inhabitants. They proposed, therefore, to depart and return to their own country. They sailed northwards along the coast and found five scralings clothed in skins sleeping near the sea. They had with them vessels containing animal marrow mixed with blood. Carlsefni's people thought that they understood that these men had been banished from the land, and they killed them. After that, they came to a nest where many wild beasts were there, and the nest was covered all over with dung from the beasts which had lain there during the night. Now they came back to Stormfjord, and there was an abundance of everything they wanted to have. It is some men say that Bjarn and Gudrid remained behind, and a hundred men with them, and did not go further, but that Carlsefni and Snorri went southwards, and forty men with them, and were no longer in hope than barely two months, and the same summer came back. Carlsefni went then with one ship to seek after Thorhall the hunter, but the rest remained, and they sailed northward past the Kjalanes, and thence westward, and the land was upon their starboard hand. There were wild woods all over, as far as they could see, and scarcely any open places, and when they had long sailed, a river fell out of the land from the east to the west. They put into the mouth of the river, and lay by its southern bank. The Death of Thorvald Eriksson It happened one morning that Carlsefni and his people saw, opposite an open place in the wood, a speck which glistened in their sight, and they shouted out towards it, and it was a uniped, which thereupon hurried down to the bank of the river where they lay. Thorvald Eriksson stood at the helm, and the uniped shot an arrow into his bowels. Thorvald drew out the arrow and said, It has killed me! To a fruitful land we have come, but hardly shall we enjoy any benefit from it. Thorvald died soon after of this wound. Upon this, the uniped ran away to the northward. Carlsefni and his people went after him, and saw him now and then, and the last time they saw him, he ran out into a bay. They drew off then into the northward, and thought they saw the country of the unipeds. They would not expose their people any longer. They looked upon the mountain range that was at Hope, and that which they now found as all one, as it also appeared to be equal length from Stromfjord to both places. The third winter they were in Stromfjord. They now became much divided by party feeling, and the women were the cause of it, for those who were unmarried would injure those who were married, and hence a great disturbance arose. There was born the first autumn Snorri, Carlsefni's son, and he was three years old when they went away. When they sailed from Vinland, they had a south wind, and came then to Markland, and found there five scralings, and one was bearded, two were females, and two were boys. They took the boys, but the others escaped, and the scralings sank down in the ground. These two boys they took with them, they taught them the language, and they were baptised. They called their mother Vatheldi, and their father, Uveig. They said that two kings ruled over the Skralings, and that one of them was called Alvaldania, and the other Valdidida. They said that no houses were there, people lay in caves or in holes. They said there was a land on the other side, just opposite their country, where people lived who wore white clothes, 
and carried poles before them, and to these were fastened flags, and they shouted loud, and the people think that this was White Man's Land, or Great Ireland. Bjorn Grimolfsson was driven with his ship into the Irish Ocean, and they came to a worm sea, and straight away the ship began to sink under them. They had a boat which was smeared with seal oil, for the sea worms do not attack that, and they went in the boat, and then saw that it could not hold them all, and then said Bjorn, since the boat cannot give room to more than half our men, it is my counsel that lots should be drawn, and for those to go in the boat, for it shall not be according to rank. This they thought also high-minded an offer, that no one would speak against it. Then they did so, that lots were drawn, and it fell upon Bjorn to go in the boat, and half of the men with him, for the boat did not have room for more. But when they had gotten into the boat, then said an Icelandic man, who was in the ship, and had come with Bjorn from Iceland, Dost thou intend, Bjorn, to separate from me here? And Bjorn answered, So it turns out. Then the other said, Very different was thy promise to thy father, when I went with thee from Iceland, than thus to abandon me, for thou saidest that we should both share the same fate. Bjorn replied, It shall not be thus. Go thou down into the boat, and I will go up into the ship, since I see that thou art so desirous to live. Then went Bjorn up into the ship, but this man down into the boat, and after that continued they their voyage until they came to Dublin in Ireland, and told were these things. But it is most people's belief that Bjorn and his companions were lost in the worm sea, for nothing was heard of them since that time.